Hi, my name is John Gibbons, and today I'm going to talk to you about the vital shoulder complex and linking it to differential diagnosis. No doubt I could spend a week at least yeah, on this topic, yeah, but I'm just going to do like an overview of some areas of the shoulder that could be uh, detrimental to the, to the patient. And hopefully, if you're a therapist, it gives you a better understanding of some pathologies that are associated to this area. Let's just have a, a recap on the shoulder itself. Then when I say the word shoulder, we're not just talking about the shoulder joint, which is medically called the glenohumeral joint, which is here. Then it also encompasses the sternoclavicular joint, the SC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint, and also the scapulothoracic articulation, which is not a joint in itself, it's like a suspension. So where the scapula will sit, um, hovering, if you like, over the, the rib cage. So we've almost got like four joints or articulations that will be part of the shoulder complex. Now, we take it for granted that we're able to lift our arm all the way up and all the way down, okay? But we can do this motion and people will say naturally it's shoulder abduction. But for you to lift your arm, let's say to 90 degrees, then it's an interaction of the glenohumeral joint and also the scapula thoracic to rotate. And because those two are involved, it also has to incorporate the AC joint and the SC joint. It's actually called scapula humeral rhythm and it works on a two to one ratio. So if you're looking at, let's say the person has abducted the arm all the way to 180 degrees, then 120 degrees will be by the glenohumeral joint in here, and then 60 degrees will be by the scapula upwardly rotating. But also, the clavicle will rotate as well, and this is allowed from the AC joint and the SC joint, which is out of view. So for you to lift your arm up is an integration of all the four joints that we just discussed. Let's have a look at this. If I'd, I'm going to jump ahead and come back. This might give, give you an idea. So the person is lifting their arm from 0 degrees to 180, but let's say they feel something. It doesn't matter what they feel. If they have an inability to maybe abduct, it could be a full tear of the supraspinatus along here. You might find if they've got an auxiliary nerve palsy, because they've dislocated the shoulder, but relocated, and the deltoid is now switched off, you might find that the deltoid is not working, so they can't abduct very far. Yeah, maybe around 45. If a lady who's 48 years old complains of shoulder pain, it could be a frozen shoulder. And the key one would be, would be she would be limited on external rotation because they call it a capsular pattern. So you might find that when she's lifting, she ends up with a, a reverse scapular humeral. If you have pain between 70 degrees and 110, then it could be a, a painful arc. Within the painful arc, typically it's the supraspinatus, but then that could be torn. You might have an infl inflamed, as in a tendinopathy, tendonitis. Yeah, but it can also have a calcific, either way for a tendinopathy. And uh, the fourth thing would be a subacromial bursa, called the SAB, that could also get caught. If you get pain more towards the end of range, it might be an AC joint problem in here. So there's a little example. So if you've got 0 to 20 degrees, full thickness tear of supraspinatus, this is inability to abduct. Maybe auxiliary nerve palsy between different degrees, adhesive capsulitis, 70 to 110, subacromial pain, okay, from the supraspinatus or from the, the bursa, and pain after that, it might be AC, but also it could also be impingement of supra towards the end. So sometimes it's not that easy to work out what's going on. A painful arc, as I mentioned. Let's just jump ahead. Let's go back, there you go. You can see here, painful arc, 70 to 110, impingement under the acromion. The acromion, I know it looks bigger here, but the space between the acromion and the top of the greater tubercle is around one centimeter. Most of the time, the acromion is flat, but sometimes it can be hooked, yeah, or even, or well, slightly curved or even hooked, and they call it a type one or a type two. Most of the space is eight to 12 mils, 10 mil being normal. If it does have less space, then it could impinge yeah, the structures, the bursa underneath it, or even a tear of the bursa, or even a tear of the supra, could also restrict the motion within the painful arc. This is an AC joint. So we are typically, there are many grades, but to keep it simple, we'll talk about three. So we have a grade one, which is a minor tear, grade two, a moderate tear, and a grade three, a full thickness tear. You can see the ligament is partly torn here. So this is the coracoid process. This is the clavicle. All right, so this is called the coracoclavicular ligaments, also split into trapezoid and conoid ligaments here. 
and then this is the coracoid chromia ligament along here. So this is the AC ligament. This would be a grid two. We would normally have a step deformity on here as well. You can see part of the coracoclavicular ligaments torn as well as a full tear of the AC. And then this would be a full tear of all. So this could be known as a grid three tear of the AC. Thing is with an AC joint, I've done mine twice actually on this side. Once the ligament is torn, it's, it's a struggle to get it back to full function. Um, it's like a hinge in the door. If you, if you take the door off and you put the hinge back on and you don't quite screw it up as normal and it's, and it's rocking, then that's like an AC joint. So it, it never truly heals. You'll always have some slight irritation with the AC joint within. Um, but in a positive, if you have a full tear and the space is further apart, then they don't tend to give you so much pain. They're unstable, but they don't give you pain. Why? Because the two bones are not rubbing together. A little bit about anatomy inside the glenohumeral joint in here. Um, you can see this is where the bicep long head attaches to the supraglenar tubercle. But if it does tear yeah, around you, that's actually four grades, and they call it a SLAP, which stands for a superior labrum anterior to posterior. So they call it a slap lesion. Four types, grade two is the most common, where the tendon attaches to the labrum, which is part of it, and then it becomes torn in here. So the pain is deep, deep in the shoulder. Like a speed test, it might pick it up. Let's move on. Now, there was a patient and she was in her 40s, and she had this sort of characteristics. She was a female, fair, fat, and 40, okay? So she was in her 40s, so they call it the four Fs. And she comes to see me because she had pain in her shoulder, but she didn't have any symptoms when she lifts her arm all the way up and all the way down. So she had a vague symptom in that area. At night, she seemed to, to make it worse. But then I asked her a question about when she went to the toilet and when she went for like the number two, then I asked her, does a stool float? And she said, yes, it's a strange question to ask me, John, but my stool seems to float. And suddenly from her coming in with shoulder pain, we're now discussing a possibility that she has a problem with the gallbladder. So she's got a gallbladder problem. But what I want you to do is think about how does a gallbladder and even the liver, because it's located on that side, actually refer to the area of the shoulder. In my class, I normally do this a bit slow, slower in terms of the interaction with the students, okay? But because I'm just talking with me, yeah, in front of the camera, yeah, then I guess I can go for these quite quickly. Um, but maybe just think about it, why that would be. Why does a gallbladder problem, you know, she might have gallstones or an inflamed, they call it like a cholecystitis. So if you've got a problem in there, or maybe a cirrhotic liver, but the patient comes in with shoulder pain. But when you ask her to lift her arms, she has full range of motion all the way up and all the way down, all the way flexion and extension. She can even circle the arm with no symptoms, but she's got symptoms to the shoulder. Also maybe a lower thoracic sort of symptom as well. Yeah, because that could be the nerve innervation. Have a look at this picture. So we've got a small gallbladder here. Yeah. So basically naturally stores the bile that's produced. And then if a stool floats, it means it's more fat. So it means something's not breaking down. So it might well be that there's a dysfunction of the gallbladder. But the gallbladder and the liver is very close, okay, to the respiratory diaphragm. And then that's innervated by the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve comes from C3, C4, C5, and the cervical spine. So if a gallbladder or the liver on this side is inflamed, then it irritates the diaphragm that then can travel via the C3-4 pathway, okay? And then it then can, it's almost like two train tracks, okay? You've got the train track supply, if you like, to the gallbladder, yeah, or the diaphragm, okay? And then you've got a train track supply for the soma, which is the rest of the body. And one can actually jump onto the other one. Yeah, sounds a bit weird to say that. Yeah, but you know, I use the word they can jump track. So all that means is you've got a problem which feeds back into the C spine of C3 to 5, but suddenly now it jumps track and gives you symptoms along the shoulder dermatone pathway of C3 to 5 area in here. So it's never pinpointed, it's like quite vague. So she's aware of something, but can't say it's fair or it's bare. A couple of weeks later, she has a gallbladder removed, comes to see me, and then she has no shoulder pain. She also would have potential pain, they call it the Murphy sign, yeah, wrong here, and just under the lower costal margin, if you were to palpate and press and let go, 
They call it like a rebound tenderness. So that might give you some symptoms. Just, so just bear that in mind. So next time a lady comes in and she's got fair color hair, she's a little bit overweight, yeah, she's in her 40s and she's female, then you might find that as you present a shoulder pain, just bear in mind it could be coming from, from that. The same, the spleen on this side, the stomach, uh, pancreas, again, these organs, yeah, via what we've already discussed, can actually radiate across to the left side. Um, the spleen, they call it Kerr sign. There is a case study I discussed where a rugby player had a huge contact to the left-hand side, felt winded, went to ground, and he'd ruptured the spleen, but he presented with pain to the left shoulder. Went to A&E, and then he had his spleen removed. But the, the, the therapist said, it's your rotator cuff, you need to do some exercises. But um, he could lift his arm all the way up and down, but his pain was excruciating to the shoulder area. Why? Because the diaphragm they refer into C3 to 5 across that shoulder area, yeah, along here. So again, just bear that in mind. Um, now, I'm going to go back on that one. One of my, one of my neighbors, um, he wanted to come and see me because he was having pain around the trapezius. I was actually away, so I couldn't see him. And his wife contacted me and she said, well, maybe I'll see somebody else. But anyway, a week or two later, she says to me, he now has a persistent cough, a painful persistent cough. But remember, his pain was in his trapezius to start with. And, um, and I said, well, you need to get at least an x-ray of a lung just to rule out any, anything pathological. Anyway, went for a scan and comes back and he has this. So if you look closely, you can see on the right side, it is known as a tumor, but is named after a uh, American pathologist called Henry Pankost. So they call it Pankost tumor. And it's normally in the top corner of the right lung um, in the apical part. So it's the, the top, almost like the, the bats in the cave, the apical right up the top, that's where it would be in, in the majority of, of, and he actually had a, a, a stage three pancos tumor. Went through a process of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, he's okay now. Yeah, but um, he would have seen me with pain to the shoulder. And you can also see the proximity to the brachial plexus, and it can refer across that sort of area in here. So you can see that he could come in with shoulder pain or even arm pain, hand pain, yeah, anything tingling. If this manifests, it could lead on to something called a Horner syndrome. And the Horner syndrome is three things. You'll notice, yeah, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. So the drooping of the eyelid around here, okay. Pupil is constricted in comparison. And then also this area of lack of sweating on one side of it. But you won't really see this unless it's in extreme cases. Most of the time they'll get dealt with uh, before they get to this stage. Now, have a look at this one, okay. I'm not going to explain anything until I show it to you. This is left side, left side only. You can see the green lymph nodes, and not green, obviously, but um, just for demonstration. You can see, and they're called the Virchow lymph node, named after Rudolf Virchow. I think it was like in 1848 or 1868, so one of the times. And um, so it sadly relates to a, the, the thoracic duct, which is a long duct for the lymphatics. If you have a secondary um, metastasis, and it blocks, then where the, the duct is trying to drain into the, the vein, the subclavian vein, um, it, it gets blocked. So they tend to, almost like a flood plane. So it tends to, to flood, if you like, within these lymph nodes in here um, because they can't get through its normal passageway. And it does tend to indicate uh, a secondary metastasis, yeah, typically maybe from the, the stomach yeah, or some form of colonic sort of area. Um, so again, you can see the, the proximity to the lymph nodes yeah, around that sort of area. So if it does contact around here, then again, the person could come in yeah, with pain to the arm and the shoulder. So I've covered a few things on there. I'm not saying I've covered everything. I will be producing more YouTube videos where I talk about other shoulder neck pathology. Uh, but I do hope uh, you enjoyed the talk. Uh, and if you do have any questions, just, uh, just leave them on uh, YouTube or send me an email and I'm sure I'll get back to you. Thanks again for watching.